Hello there. It's Charlene Campbell with Colin the Midwife. I hope you're well. I'm trying this new angle for the camera. I hope that, that you can see me better and that the light shines on me as I'm teaching. So here we are. Hi, how are you doing? I'm back again today. I've got a nice schedule for us today. Uh, a good list of things like I did last time. So I hope you're all well. We've had a really beautiful few days here with weather and with the moon and the stars. I live in a place where you can see the sky really well and I had a neat experience. I'm gonna share it with you later when I sing my song. Okay, I thought I would start with the candle and a little scripture because, you know, I wanna bring in kind of a sense of pacing and a sense of, um, continuing on with some of the things I've been doing, which I find it soothing to uh, see the candle in the background. I really do. There we go. And that's, um, I just ask Father in heaven and Mother in heaven to bless us this day and bless me that I will be able to bring forth the, the offering that is the most um, enriching and helpful for everyone. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, so there's our candle for peace and for good learning today, too. Okay, there we go. How are you all doing today? I see somebody's here. Welcome to Call in the Midwife. Hope you're doing good today. Hope this is a good angle. I like that picture in the background, so maybe I'll put it there. Okay, hope you can see me and um, that you enjoy today. So I've got my scripture here. I just opened it like I did last time. I opened it up and um, here it is. Behold, the Lord will, ca will carry thee. Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity and will surely cover thee. I thought, wow, that's kind of neat if you were being held in the covering of the Lord. And so that's my goal today is that I'm held in covering of my Lord Jesus. Because, you know, it feels nice. You don't ever have to worry about being fearful. And fear can make you do things, especially in labor. I remember the very first, I still have an itchy eye. The very first book that my mother exposed me to, my mom was a nurse, okay? And she was, she had all nine of her children without um, any medications. And she breastfed all of us back in the 50s, which was really rare. Um, she saw women go under twilight sleep and be, you know, thrashing around and having trauma, traumatic experiences from what they were going through. So she was determined. And the book that she read was Grantley Dick Reed's book, Childbirth Without Fear. And it's really true that fear creates a tension pain cycle in labor. So where you have fear, that creates tension, that creates pain, and then more fear. And it just, it, it spirals, right? So you really want to learn how to, con actually controlling your breathing is a really good thing to learn during pregnancy or even before you get pregnant, I think, is learning, doing some meditations where you're, in a guided visualization or if you have some nice slow music or counting or something where you just really relax and you take nice deep in breaths and out breaths and you learn to control your breathing and then you can practice when you're feeling stressed or you've got something happening in through the nose out through the mouth and in our classes she has us she has us um hold our our rib cage while we're breathing and feel it expanding and going in. So we're not just breathing right here in the upper chest, we're breathing right down deep. Deep diaphragm breathing out through the mouth. And especially if you can do the slower on the out breath and you can do four counts, like breathing in for four counts, holding for four counts and breathing out. I like to do six counts instead of four counts on the out breath because a little bit longer is good. 
and then breathing in for four, holding for four, and then six. Okay, so we got our scripture, we had our candle. Now, um, I wanted to take you through just a very, very quick little guided visualization for your for birth, okay? Just a really short one, okay? I wanna try to do one where it's actually on its own video. So like a mom or anybody could just turn it on and have it ready, you know, at the very beginning of the med of the visualization and then play it through and go to sleep or something. I talked to my sister, Teresa from Canada and she really, really said it helped her to listen to, I make these audio tapes with the guided, um, affirmations and stuff on them and she said she would listen to it every night and it really helped her sleep so i'm just going to do a really short one so you can get kind of just an idea of what it's like and then you can um i can i can make a bigger one like a longer one another time that's separate from this just to give you an idea okay so just take a moment we're just going to take a moment right now i've got my big bowl here i'll give us a little signal to get to start And with each breath, I want you to just feel your body relaxing more and more and feeling calmer and calmer and being able to just let yourself feel peace coming over you. With each breath, you're letting go more and more. With each out breath, you're just releasing all any emotion that's negative, anything that's been um, uncomfortable or traumatic in your life is just letting go now. It's just letting go. It's just being released in the name of Jesus. And you're taking in a nice deep breath and letting it just flow in and out now on its own, just as its own natural, what it feels right. Nice paced breathing, okay? In through the nose, out through the mouth. And wherever you're sitting, I want you to just become aware of your sit bones, wherever they are. And maybe put yourself in a more upright position if you're slouching, or you could be lying down if you are lying down. That's okay. But not slouching. You want your spine nice and straight right now. And you can close your eyes, or you can kind of just soften your gaze and look at a focal point, focal point in your room anything could be a focal point could be a picture could be a door could be you know something that's not too big okay and you take a nice deep breath and you just focus and i want you to see the sun shining in your mind you just see this beautiful sunny day and you feel yourself just calm, walking out into the sunshine. And you're on a beautiful path on a trail on the side of a mountain. And as you step forward, there's birds singing and butterflies flying past. There's a beautiful, sweet song of different birds making beautiful, harmonious blends of music. And the trees are waving in the wind and their leaves are making beautiful sounds also. And as you walk up this hill, you just see this beautiful sunshine. And there's a river to your left and a mountain to your right. And up above is the sun glistening through the beautiful blue sky. And as you look up, you just see this beautiful angel coming forward towards you. This is your guardian angel. Could be your savior, could be your mother in heaven, could be a special guardian angel, whoever might be comfortable for you that you know already 
and you just, this person walks over to you and takes your hand and you go and you sit on this beautiful bench that's under this gorgeous apple tree. And you're still doing your nice deep breathing and you're feeling such peaceful relaxation with the golden warmth of the sparkling sunshine on you. And on the river, you can see it sparkling on the water with glistening diamonds of silver and white and gold. And there's a beautiful rainbow that you see in the sky over the mountainside. And as you relax, this person, this angel from heaven takes your hand and just says, everything is going to go perfectly well. It's all designed for you. You can, you can be assured that you will be able to make the best decisions for you going forward. You will be able to rise up to your divine potential and all your cells and DNA and body systems now will be upgraded to a divinely um, enhanced uh, improvement for yourself and functioning at their optimal levels now, functioning at their optimum levels and your baby is growing at its optimal uh, rate with optimal nutrition. Your placenta is functioning perfectly, pumping, pumping perfectly the blood through into the baby that's full of oxygen and nutrients and all the waste and any waste is being easily released from the baby and your body knows exactly how to process it. Your liver and all your body organs are functioning optimally. You can see the light of the sun just shining in through your body as this, um, your guide, your, your savior, Jesus, or your mother in heaven or your father in heaven, who ever you choose to make this person. Um, they're just telling you this. And as they hold your hand, it, the light is just this knowledge and this light is being transferred in through your hand, through into your body and into your baby, into your uterus, into your fallopian tubes, into your ovaries and into your eggs and into your mind to heal all generational trauma and any other trauma from previous births or anything of the like or childhood trauma of any kind is being released. And we call this forth to uh, be just like a coating of light, just kind of coming over you and like honey dripping through, like a holy um, honey that just clears out anything and sanctifies and purifies your vessel, your body, your heart, and your mind. To be a light and a holy um, carrier of this child from heaven, and that this will be a positive, uplifting pregnancy, a positive uplifting birth experience where you will be surrounded by people who love you, who care about you, who support you, who uh, will reflect your sovereign authority back to you. And you will be able to stand in your sovereign authority, but also in a soft place that you'll be able to trust that you're, that you're being cared for, sorry, that you're being cared for and guided and being watched over as you uh, birth your baby as you go through your pregnancy and in your postpartum period. And I, I, uh, I just want you to take another deep breath. Take it in and just let, and just let anything that else that needs to be said to be said. You can just like let it come. It might come in the form of a little visual or of someone that you see that should be there at your birth supporting you whatever that, that intuition you can trust that you can trust that holy spirit and um now you say goodbye and you you just feel a burden lifted off you it's like a a big suitcase or like a backpack of rocks and you, you actually literally take it off and you give it to him or her and you just feel this lightened and you don't feel worried about your birth you don't feel worried about your body you're attracted to foods that actually make you healthy strong and fit and you're attracted to foods that help your mind be strong and you're attracted to activities and exercise and people that will support you in your sovereign decision making and in your role as a mother as a wife as a daughter of god on the earth doing your very best and um, you say goodbye now, 
a big hug, big hug of love, and you just feel this warmth through your heart, dissipating all your fears, dissipating all concerns. And you just have this sense of knowing that everything's going to work out perfectly well in divine timing and divine right order. And you say goodbye, you walk back down the hill. And you take a nice deep breath, you see the birds singing, you see the river sparkling. And now you start to just move your hands and move your, touch your face, feel your soft skin and give yourself a nice big hug <laughs> and a nice deep breath. Okay, we did a guided visualization. Now, <laughs> I'm gonna take a drink. How's everybody doing? I have a really nice um, rock here. It's a beautiful um, amethyst. You could guide yourself like that, you know. You don't even need anybody else to do it. You can just choose something that works. There's a great book called, um, uh, what's it called now? It's a, it has these scripts that you could read. And there's one called A Special Place. Carl Jones. Uh a Guided Visualization for Pregnancy and Childbirth, I believe it's called, by Carl Jones. And it's excellent. It really is. It's got some great guided meditations. But you're basically programming your brain to be really calm and in more of an alpha state during labor, which is really, really good for your hormones and good for your everything, <laughs> for your pain uh, tolerance levels are going to be way higher if you can do that. Okay. I'm going to show a couple of little breastfeeding pictures because I really do want to talk a little more about breastfeeding today. Um, and these are black and white, so I don't know how good you can see these. Let's see. That's a mother breastfeeding. There she is. And uh, yeah, I think um, the laid back breastfeeding, like I talked about before, this is another one of me in. Um, Jamaica with a mom showed you another one the other time breastfeeding we did all breastfeeding there too okay now we're going to do our song <laughs> I hope you're well I was happy to see some people watched my video last time I really want to get the word out about how important it is to prepare. And I'm going to continue on to our list that we started last time for our, um, I think I forgot to put that in the title actually, but I'm going to continue first aid station um, birth pod list today, okay? So hold on if you're interested in that. Um, but before that, I'm going to tell you just a quick story about how I picked out the song for today. I was awakened last night and I went outside and the sky was just all stars. It was so beautiful. It was just magnificent. Okay. And uh, the moon was actually covered, half covered. So it was a crescent moon that was kind of golden on the horizon and it was half covered by clouds. So when I walked back in, I couldn't really tell why the shape was so odd, but it really was just a half of a really large golden colored crescent moon and I came back up and I was just going to go in but then I turned around and the clouds started to go down and the whole moon started to show and it was so pretty and I sang this song that I used to sing with my group pot apple pie acapella and um, as I'm standing there singing it I saw two shooting stars and I had been out there for about oh, probably five or ten minutes before that, no shooting stars. <laughs> so the power of singing is huge. I really believe it is. Okay, I had to write the words out because I, I didn't want to forget them. Here's another one of my pictures I was showing you the other day, some of these. I love these pictures. They have beautiful some symbolic um, images of Heavenly Mother. And this is Our Lady of New Vision. I love to see myself um, as a lady of new vision. And I am. 
and the lady of my vision. I hope you can see that too. When we when we have things in the past, we have to let go of. We have to be able to see ourselves in a new light. All right. You ready? It feels a little funny having you up so high, but I think it makes it so the light goes in my eyes and I'm not looking down like I was before. So I hope this is better. <laughs> you can let me know if, what you think about it if you want to. <laughs> Hope you're well. Okay, here we go. As we sat in front of that August moon, you said the clouds, they look like angel wings. Sometimes I if you could read my mind Cause I was thinking The very same thing When I'm with you All the stars shine through My heart opens like a morning flower you know i'd leave it all behind because my only peace of mind is when i'm here with you so tell me your dreams lay your head on my pillow tell me the things that you hide away your pain your pleasure your sorrow tell me the things that you hide away your pain your pleasure your sorrow we used to sing that three-part harmony and um, with my band, Ernie and Jack in Hot Apple Pie. And I love that song. It, it, like, really, what do people need? They need love and belonging. They need you to care about how they feel, their pain, their sorrow, and their, um, what's the other one? Pleasure. Their pleasure, too. Well, let's keep going. We're going to go into breastfeeding now. We're going to do this out of this book, okay, that we've worked with this book before on our last one. Okay, so here we are. If you've got this book, I highly recommend it. Heart and Hands, A Midwife's Guide. And this is good for parents, too. I think this is a good parents book. If you want to become more uh, aware and educated and knowledgeable about your birth, if you just go to a regular class, you know, a regular childbirth class or read online, you're not necessarily going to get the full <laughs> the full understanding. Now, this may have more than you want to know, but I think this is a really good thing to, to study for people who are more interested in learning more. Okay, we're going to go on page 200, okay? Now, what we're doing here is we are... We are doing uh, just a review of the breast exams and just what you can do to help a mom for breastfeeding during uh, during the third day or around thereabouts, okay? So the breasts, you wanna stay alert to any reddened areas or any real engorgement that does not go away. You know, sometimes you can have a lot of engorgement on the third day. Um, but if there's improper positioning or there's redness around the nipple or even red 
spots anywhere on the outside. There can be ducts that can get plugged or clogged, okay? So a really good thing to have mama do, okay, is to have her get into a warm bath. If she doesn't have a tub, she can immerse her breasts in a basin of warm water, not too hot, but warm. Now what that'll do, if she does her whole body, it's really good because the whole body will relax and the letdown will come in. Now, once she's got her whole body soaked in warm water or her breasts, then she can practice um, the massage, which I'm going to show you, okay? I've got a, a breast model here. I'm going to show you with this. Now, if you, just to remember, when you're doing breast massage during postpartum for, for any reason whatsoever, if you're trying to get your letdown in, or if you've got a, a gorgement or a plugged area, what you want to do is you want to start right underneath your clavicle and then you go right under the arm because these ducts can go, this whole area is breast tissue, okay? So then what you're going to do is you're going to come down and you're going to go like this. And say if there's a lump right here, okay? You're going to go behind that lump and you're not going to just like skirt over it. You're going to actually go behind it and you're going to push on it a bit gently but with the water, especially if you're in the shower or the tub, you can hang your breasts and do this. And then you're going to actually go right to the nipple. And you should do that at least, you know, 10 times or so, and then move to the next spot. And then you're going to do it there, okay? And, and you go all the way around your breast, okay? And then it'll usually start coming out. And if you've got a plugged duct, you can go behind the duct um, and let you know really work it out to try to get that milk to move okay all right let's keep going how you doing welcome to call on the midwife charlene campbell happy to be back again i've got some good stuff for us i think if you if you stick around it'll be fun <laughs> learning is good it helps our brains and it helps us be more knowledgeable in the moment i think when we have things come up for us or for other people or whatever, as far as birth goes, especially. Okay. Now, um, after learning how to express your milk, okay, then um, let's see, where are we going to go to next? Well, what are some of the remedies that you can use? Okay. What are some of the remedies that you can use to help you, um, you know, with the pain, if you've got engorgement or pain. Now, this isn't kind of a, seems like it's not, it might not be, you know, might might be almost like an old wives tale, but it's actually really good and it really works. And I've seen it work. I have experienced it. You guessed it. Raw cabbage leaves. You can also use steamed comfrey leaves if you don't have cabbage, okay? Because a lot of us can grow comfrey. I have a huge comfrey plant. If you don't have one, you could get one, I'm sure, from someone who has it because they always grow extra extra um, sprouting plants, you know, beside the original plant so you can give them away. But so that's a thing that you could do in a low resource setting is you could steam the comfrey leaves and put them inside the person's uh, over top of the breasts, either inside the shirt or inside the bra, whatever they're wearing. And that can go for the raw cabbage as well, okay? Um, and then you keep repeating it. You leave them on for 20 minutes, and then you repeat it three or four times throughout, throughout the day. And then the other thing you can also do for lingering engorgement is hot ginger compresses under the arms or in the upper outer quadrants of the breasts out here because it's kind of a spicy hot thing, ginger, so you want to put it right on your breast, but under your arm and on the side like that, okay? Now, the now what can you do for cracked nipples? Well, number one is check the latch, okay? Make sure baby is, is latching correctly and do alternative latch holds, okay? Like football and other things. And then um, the... Oh, and vitamin E ointment can be applied to the nipple if it's cracked, okay? 
And you can also put uh, cold cabbage leaves against the nipples and they provide relief. Okay, that's that. That's that, just a little nutshell for us, okay? Now let's see what's next. I've got it, my list, I'm keeping to it. <laughs> Hope everybody's well today. And if you're pregnant or if you are helping pregnant moms or if you're postpartum, if you're a doula, a midwife, or just a lay person wanting to help people, this can be helpful for you. All of these things are going to be for like uh, more general, but also it's nice to have extra knowledge and information, even if you're not the one being uh, the helper, but you're the one being helped. It's also good to understand that the dynamics of a birth and what's involved. And a little bit later, I'm going to go into the role play um, for, let's see if we're at that yet. Yes, we are. Right now we're going to do that. <laughs> okay. Now where I'm getting this from is from the labor and delivery manual. And it's on page 36 if you have it and you want to follow me with me. Um, role play is an important part of emergency preparation. Yes, it's huge. Uh, I've done a lot of research on this. And um, you can read, you can study, you can learn, you can have all the knowledge in your head. But if you don't have the muscle memory in your body of the role playing, and that's another thing I really want to do on here is I want to get some ladies together and I want to go through the scenarios and give you demonstrations of each of the variations of normal birth, then some variations of normal, and then some um, complications, okay, and emergencies. And then go through each scenario with us doing it, like myself, Nikki, and Faileen, and Ambria, or somebody, some of the regular people that come to our women's circles here. And then we could show them on here. And I think that, that would be highly educational, I'm sure, to get an example of how to respond appropriately and kind of what the dynamics look like between the different roles and the uh, the person who's acting as the pregnant mom. You always want somebody to be as realistic as you can, to stay in character, and to start at the beginning of the scenario and stay in character all the way till who's ever there leading the scenario says it's over. And that way you actually get more muscle memory if you're not um, interrupting it with laughter or talking or even teaching, you know, like trying to teach the other person more because you know more. It's usually better to just leave it as if it's a real life event and you're doing it as more most realistically as you can in that scenario, okay? Now, um, you, you don't really need a lot of people to do them, but I think having at least three is good. We used to have three to five people in each of our breakout groups when we did our classes, and that seems to be a good number between three to five people, okay? So you don't necessarily have every role filled, but if you have extra people, they can rotate roles so they can, one time they can play you know the baby catcher one time they can play the doula one time they can play the mother that's birthing and you rotate the roles so that each person gets a chance to have that muscle memory being in the various roles and what's really interesting at our circles that i've noticed is so cool is that when we do this role play at almost invariable the mothers will actually go through some kind of like healing because they're being so nurtured as, but they maybe weren't nurtured as much as they had hoped during their actual deliveries. And then what happens is there's a healing that takes place. Okay, so I think it's healing for us to go through positive nurturing birth scenarios as well. Um, so you each, uh, the group leader, okay, this is what the group leader does. They take a role on and have each student. So that's what you do. If you have a group leader, they, they take one of the roles and then they assign one of the roles to each of the people in their group, okay? And then they encourage all participants to stay in character throughout the role play. This is very important. Rotate roles until everyone in the group has a chance to practice. And then extras can watch and wait for their turns to be in the group play if you have lots of people, okay? And it's actually good because... The people who are watching, as they're watching the scenarios played out, say it's for a shoulder dystocia, they're watching it played out in different ways by different people. They can actually 
learn a lot by watching. You can learn a lot by watching, but you still should get in there and be part of the role play for you to get the full impact of the muscle memory on your body. Okay, you need that muscle memory. Um, so if you're playing the mother's role, you act as if you are truly in labor. You act according to the birth scenario read by the facilitator. So we have like 12 different birth scenarios in here, but you can make up your own. You could make something up like, you know, we're, we're waiting in a lineup uh, after evacuating from a fire and um, the car in front of us, the lady gets out and she's in labor and there's a forest right beside us. And I've got a 72 hour pack and a birth pack in my bag, bag and my friends also trained. And we jump in and we just, we help deliver the baby right on the ground. There's no, there's no way an emergency vehicle could pass through what we're, the congestion on the freeway that we're in from this evacuation. Okay, that's just one scenario, potential scenario. Could be multiple, multiple. And these, I hear these all the time. Like, uh, these are all based on real things. <laughs> I've actually, um, they're not all based on real things, but a lot of them are based loosely on real events that I've actually heard from people at my classes who have come to my classes and shared with me these stories of either themselves or other people they know or experiences where they've been a bystander where somebody had their baby uh, unexpectedly. One was my friend um, from Bellevue, Dawn Thompson. She um, was on a ferry once and <laughs> There was a lady, I'm not kidding you, she was in the bathroom all by herself. No one would go in. Everyone was afraid of her. She was literally delivering the baby on the floor with no towels, nothing, by herself. Dawn went in. She she rallied around. She got people to get stuff, sent for the captain. They did everything. She delivered the baby right there on the floor. She had six babies with midwives herself at home. So she was quite confident with herself. Um, and her own training, even though she really didn't have any actual training, but she didn't, but she wasn't afraid. There were literally 50 people standing outside the bathroom. No one would go in for whatever reason. It could be combinations of reasons, but you're on a ferry. There's no one else to do it. There's nobody there to who's competent. And she goes in and delivers the baby. So this is a real true story. And these things happen over and over and over. I hear them at my classes. Okay. So follow your instincts, especially if you know how to do, if you know how to make vocalizations that are pretty typical of birth. And sometimes you might end up being like an over anxious mother that needs to be calmed down. Then we go through those. How do you help a mother breathe through her nose and out through her mouth? You breathe with her. You get eye contact with her. You hold her chin and she'll let you breathe with me. That's right. Let's do this. You've got it. That's right. And you just keep reaffirming, reassuring, reaffirming, rebuilding her confidence that she can do it. Yes, she can. She's already doing it. And if she expresses her concerns and her worries and stuff, you can still acknowledge it and keep her on that road of feeling confident and, um, you know, that she has what it takes. She can do it. And you keep reminding her about it. Okay. You stay in character till the scenario is completely over. Okay. That's really important. Um, now, the number two is the baby catcher role. Okay. Um, speak confidently and calmly. Yes. Your words, your tone, your manner. It is contagious. So everything that we our, even what we're feeling underneath our outward appearance is contagious. So if we bring it up to our eyes, you know, our smile, even if we're just, hi, you know, you bringing that emotion into your eyes, that emotion of concern, of care, and of, you know, competence in yourself and your own confidence as well. Okay. So speak confidently and calmly, take a breath and stay present and in tune, pray for strength and trust in God. Yes. Um, if you have any faith at all, birth is a time where the veil is very thin. So yes, you will receive angelic ministrations. That's why our class is called the Errand of Angels. It's because I've experienced angels at every birth I've ever gone to. 
And yes, they're there. <laughs> the, they could be the families, you know, that, that are helping bring that through. But I think there's a Holy Spirit at every birth, okay? And um, I think fostering that is really good because it helps the mother feel more confident when the spirit is strong. And when that spirit is there, it's always going to be more comforting for her. So let's see. Take control of the situation. You have the training to do so. Unless there's someone with more training than you. So like if there's somebody there with more training than you, then you would support that person. But if you're the only one that has any kind of training around you, then you take control. You um, command onlookers to put their cell phones away. You instruct one person a space keeper role. So you give that person a designation to go and be a space keeper role. Now, if that means they have to do like the what the elephants do where they make a people wall and everybody faces out with their backs to the birthing mom. If you've got no cardboard, no, no way to get away, no curtains, nothing. And you're in a big room, like a big auditorium, you know, where you've evacuated to or something, you need to create some kind of privacy because, uh, the mother not having privacy is an interruption to the hormonal cocktail. So creating privacy, whether through a people wall, through moving the mom to, a, to a, another location that's more private or creating a screen with cardboard or walls or whatever. Okay. And then you also have someone call 911 if that's available. Have them call emergency medical services if it's available. Okay. And then if... Um, if many people call, keep this in mind, okay? Say three or four people call 911. That is going to potentially plug lines up that need to be left open. So you designate one person and you do a closed loop conversation where you have them tell you what happened, you know, that they've completed the call and that they're on their way or whatever's happening, okay? Um, or if in some cases they can't come and so that you just go you just proceed the best you can okay direct onlookers to turn their backs in form of a human wall to protect mother's privacy yes um, ask for a person to be your assistant one person instruct others to respect the mother by staying quiet ask mother when her baby's due and if it's 36 weeks or more than her she's she's a, in, within her normal due date is 36 weeks or more if she's less than that be prepared her baby could be small could have more trouble breathing it could be premature okay which is prior to 36 weeks um, make sure you use skin to skin contact for all the babies but especially the preemies and make sure that they're dry and have extra warmth available and um, sometimes you have to spoon feed them colostrum from the mother's expressed breast milk if they are too small to really have a sucking, a really strong suck reflex yet. But they need to be given that, and it really helps them to get stronger, the colostrum. If possible, have an assistant gather paper, pen, and ask assistant to record time of birth and names, etc. Um, you are the one who will catch the baby and place the baby on mother's chest, or the mother can catch the baby, or the father, if the father's there, could help too. Um, work closely with the doula and your assistant, and be aware, easily adaptable to the needs of the mother and baby. That's that's really important. Don't have like a strict agenda of what you think is going to happen or what you think should happen. You want to have a observe, don't absorb kind of an energy where you're observing, taking in information, being intuitive, and then responding accordingly and appropriately, okay? Um, after the birth, you're assessing baby for breathing, heart rate, color, which is less important as these other ones because the baby can often be purple at the beginning, but then over a few minutes, the central part of the body should turn pink. The face and the central part of the chest and body should be pink, even if the hands and feet are still purple, okay? Um, and then muscle tone is huge. You know, what the muscle tone is, is how stiff the, you know how babies come out? They're kind of like this, right? They're kind of stiff. Now, that's good. Babies need to be stiff. If they're loose like this, like a rag doll, that's a bad sign. That means even if it hasn't been 30 to 60 seconds, if a baby's really loose like that and is white and doesn't have purple in them, 
They need resuscitation immediately. Okay. But if they're purple and they've got good tone, even if they're not breathing for the first 30 to 60 seconds, they're going to be getting good oxygen from the cord blood. So you want to keep the cord pumping and allow the baby to be on the mother's belly and skin to skin. Okay. Let's keep going. How you doing? All right. Ask. Oh, assess the mother for bleeding. So yes, you always do want to assess the mother for bleeding. Now, how do you assess the mother for bleeding? You need her in her flat on her back, and you're going to check between the belly button and the pubic bone, and you're going to massage in there until you find a hard grapefruit. That's her nice firm. And sometimes you don't even need to. Sometimes you just go in there and you're like, whoa, there it is, hard grapefruit right there. If with a really healthy mom, that can be the way it is. It's nice. And with all the hormonal co cocktails pumping perfectly, with no interruptions to the pregnancy, uh, especially the labor, delivery, and birth, and postpartum, immediate postpartum, and the hormonal cocktails are high for mother and for baby afterwards, you're going to have a more smooth transition for both mom and baby. Okay. So we've got number three is baby catcher assistant role. You just basically assist the baby catcher, follow uh, her lead. And the second assistant baby catcher is another person more like a doula who would go get food, water, and, you know, sometimes having a straw. I think if you, ha if you have it, a straw is really nice because then it's easier for the mom to take a sip out of a straw than it is to... Um, try to take a, a drink like that. And if you hold the straw up to her mouth, even if she doesn't really, maybe she wouldn't be so inclined to take a drink herself, but maybe in between contractions, she needs hydration. So it's easy for her to then lean down, just take a little sip in between if she's pushing or whatever and keep her body hydrated. It could, could be water, could be labor aid, could be highly diluted juice, but not too sweet and with electrolyte balance in it. Okay. So then number five is the doula role. You your focus is on the mother and her emotional well-being. Okay. You encourage her to void every two hours or urinate every two hours and drink fluids and eat as she's able to. Okay. You breathe with her slowly and deeply with eye, con eye contact and confident reassurance like I've been talking about. Yes. You work with her, you comfort her, and you quietly encourage her as she births. You follow her lead, okay? When she moves, you move. Be sure to move with her and follow her lead. Oh, that was the next point. <laughs> encourage position change as indicated. Yes, you don't want a mother to stay in a position for too, too long. Um, you know, maybe 30 minutes, maybe a, enough time, and then move on. Or if she's resting and her labor is really long, she might rest for a couple of hours and then get up. But um, yeah, keeping moving is good. And then the doula assistant, she works closely with the baby catcher and your assistant, and she gathers help and delegates and, um, you know, to get towels or cloths or water or food or whatever that can be uh, resourced from outside of the circle of the birth, the bubble that you create, the bubble of safety that you create as the birth place. And then you place absorbent cloth, towels or blankets under the mother for comfort, warmth and cleanliness and absorption. And you anticipate what the baby catcher will need, including something to keep the baby dry and something to place the placenta in after the birth. It can also be good for if the mother has to throw up or void. You're going to need some kind of receptacle. That could be a stainless steel bowl, um, um, a pot, or a bucket, or something like that, okay? And then you want to obtain and give nourishment to the mother during labor and after the birth and prioritize her for food and gather items to record the birth. Now the space keeper role, 
Uh, the safe space keeper role I mentioned earlier, um, that person calls 911. They, um, if it's available, sometimes it won't be available, sometimes it will, but you should always try and call 911 if you can. If you're at an unexpected delivery, you should try to get emergency medical services to come. And then you are maintaining the safe space according to the direction of the baby catcher. Yeah, you, you know, she asks you to have somebody leave, then maybe you could help them go if they are making too much noise or something. You could ask them to go. Now, I'm not going to go into the scenarios, but that's from our um, labor and delivery training for the low resource and emergency settings. Yay. All right, T. Now, what's next on our list here? Hope you're doing good. Thanks for joining me today. And um, let's see here. We've done that. Oh, making the birth bed. Okay. This is... Uh, this is just a, a little bit of information on how to prepare for a birth. If you have the resources and you can make a birth bed, knowing how to put a birth bed together is super helpful. Okay. So you don't get blood on the bed or anything like that. And you know how it's all supposed to go. Okay. Now I've, I've got, this is what I give to my clients when I was practicing midwife, I would give this um, instruction but just to give you kind of an idea is what we would do is we would go in and we would basically make the bed up the way we would want it for after the birth. Okay. So it's got a cover. It's got a, um, a plastic cover on it. It's got a sheet on it. It's going to have maybe um, a top sheet and another cotton blanket. Okay. And then the cotton blanket you would just fold it up and then you would put another plastic sheet over top of that. And then you'd put another regular sheet and basically that would be your birth bed. So when you, when you are done your birth and it's kind of messy and you've got fluids and blood and whatnot on the bed, what you do is you actually pick up the dirty uh, soiled sheets, throw them in the wash and underneath that is a fully bed, made bed that's not soiled because it's been underneath the plastic, okay? It's really good. It's, I remember I read it, my first time that I learned about that was in Polly Block's birth book. She's a, it's a very old book. It's like a little textbook, but of more root, like the old pioneer ways. And what they would do is they would take newspaper. They do this on Call on the Midwife too, the show Call on the Midwife. You can learn a lot from that show. They put about this thick of newspapers under the sheet and that absorbs the, um, the fluids. It really does. So save your newspapers. They're great for births for absorbing fluids if they're clean. Okay. So lay the plastic sheeting down first, being sure to let the edge hang down over your mattress and box springs. You may have to duct tape the edges in place. And if you use duct tape, I think duct tape, is a good thing to have in your birth kit. I really do. Um, I think duct tape is amazing for a lot of things. But if you tape it, then it's not going to slide around on the mattress, and then you can just untape, undo it when you're done. Okay. Um, then lay a towel or mattress cover where mom will be so that there's more absorbent See, okay? Then put a set of clean sheets. The towel or mattress cover helps keep mom from slipping all over and the feeling so sticky and sweaty. Like if you have plastic and then you just have a sheet, it doesn't feel so good. So make sure you have either a big, nice thick towel or a mattress pad between the plastic and the sheet, okay? And then um, some people like to layer two or three layers of plastic and new sheets so that one layer can easily be removed when dirty. That's what we would do. We would do two layers. Um, however, this uses a lot of plastic. Yes, it does. And you have to be really careful taking it off so that you don't make the bottom ones dirty. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Those are all true. Have lots of pillows, cover them with drawstring garbage bags, and then pillowcases. They often get a bit dirty at the birth. So yeah, you can put just a big garbage bag tied up with a drawstring, and then over top of that, put a pillowcase. And the pillow doesn't get all soiled and wet. 
If the mom's using it different ways, she doesn't have to worry about that. Um, as much room for movement around the bed as possible. So don't have like a bunch of stuff all around the bed. You want to have a lot of movement and open spaces around the bed. And the same thing if you're having a water birth. The bathroom should be completely clear. The floor should be clear. Um, the door outside the bathroom in the hallway should be clear. You know, keep the areas clear when you're doing deliveries. Um, it just makes for less um, clutter and more streamlined movements and stuff. Have plus, sometimes you might have to get the mother out of the tub, and you always should have, we always would have a rolled up mat. Always at every single birth, if we were doing a water birth, we had a rolled up mat that was ready to deliver on right beside near the bathroom. And that could be rolled out and she could be lifted right out of the tub or step out of the tub on her own accord with some support, usually one person on each side and lay right down. Like if she, if sticky shoulders or if there was a bleed or if anything wasn't um, typical and normal flowing, we could do that. We wouldn't have to like try to get her over to some bed in another room or something. That's an emergency measure that I always used. And I thought it was very good. We did use it now and then too. But most of the time, the birth goes without a hitch. But now and then, you need to get the mom out of the tub, okay? And onto the floor, flat on her back, usually in either McRoberts or hands and knees, whatever position you're going to use or whatever you're dealing with. Um, for a shoulder dystocia, hands and knees can be a really good way to get the baby out. Okay, um, where are we at now? Yeah. I think that's it. Tidy up clutter and extra furniture items that maybe cause lack of movement for the mother. Like I think making sure that the mother has as much movement without being hindered at all in her movements. And also for emergency purposes. Like I said, you want to be able to use the space. Okie dokie. I'm going to read you a little quote. But first I want to show you a couple of nice pictures, okay? These are some nice pictures. This was a baby born here, actually. Um, there's mom. She did laid back breastfeeding very successfully. There's daddy holding little his little girl while mama takes the shower. And there's mama with just a couple minutes from the birth. Baby was born in the call. That was their first out of hospital birth. No, I think they've had a birth center birth before in California, but then this was their first for a couple births and they really enjoyed it. <sighs> She's got the birth, like awe, kind of like that awe after you have your baby. So yeah, those are really neat pictures. Okay, um, I'm going to read a little quote. Um, this is out of a neat book that I really like. I've got my marker in here with one of my pictures. It's called Our Lady of the Star Blossom. Isn't that pretty? I love this art. It depicts the divine feminine in such nice ways. We don't have a lot of pictures of divine feminine around. Okie dokie. It's my grandson, just fell out of there. <laughs> okay. But this book, okay, it's called Zion's Hope, Pioneer Midwives and Women Doctors of Utah. I'm just going to read this quote on page 71 by Mrs. Lloyd Hansen. Oh, she's writing about... Um, Jody... Her name's Jody. okay? I don't really know who this person, but this is just an example of what pioneer midwives did um, in the olden days during when this book was written. It was written by Honey M. Newton, certified nurse midwife. Often the food was scarce, and when stranger or friend came to her door, she shared what she had, saying, Bread and butter with a welcome is better than a banquet without one. 
She loved to do the things she was called to do. She loved her husband and family. She never complained. She gave her wisdom and power because she could translate pain into joy. She could translate pain into joy. I love that. There's some really nice stories in here of some amazingly just like I think transcendent women who've, you know, been such good examples. Okay, duties of a second attendant. How are we doing? We're at one hour. I'm going to finish this because I'm almost done. We've got two more things left. Okay. This is a really nice picture of a mom breastfeeding. Laid back breastfeeding. And uh, it's another one. It's kind of hard to see that one, really. If you can see. It's a nice one. Mothers need to rest, bond, and take time with their new baby. Mother may be wide awake or sleepy. Keep the air fresh with no drafts after the birth. Foods and fluids will help her body adjust to this stage. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about the duties of a second attendant. Now this is from this book. Midwife's Assistant Orientation Manual. If you're interested in it, you can get it at midwifefreetoday.com. And I'm going to be working on page 70 today. Okay. Thank you for joining me who's over here. Really appreciate you being here. <laughs> All right. We're getting there. We've got two more things left on our schedule, and then we're going to be done. I hope you're enjoying today's class. I am. I find it's very healing for me to do these. You know, it's like when I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing and doing my mission, there's such a sense of completion in that. Also serving others. It's very good for my soul. I like doing it. Hope you enjoy it. All right. Take care. Let's, let's move along. What are some of the duties of a second attendant? Okay. Now this is in a midwifery practice. So this isn't for necessarily an unexpected situation. This probably most likely is a planned situation, but you never know. Um, one of the things that happened with us in Seattle when I was practicing midwife there, a licensed midwife in Seattle, was we were put on alert when we had an Ebola crisis and the midwives were put on alert that they might get called and women might have to birth in place because the hospitals would become unsafe because of the infection rates to mothers and babies. And so we were actually being prepared. So you could actually be assisting a midwife or something in the future too, if you prepared and you are offering yourself for that. Okay. Check the layout of supplies to easy access uh, the equipment and the medications. So making sure you know where her stuff is, you know her birth bags, you know where everything is, you know how she likes it laid out, whether it's in a bowl, on a tray, or wherever she likes it on a counter. Make sure you have a nice big surface to put your stuff on. If you don't and you come to a house and there isn't at least a large, you know, maybe four by two feet space of some kind that you can put your stuff on, then you need to clean an area and create a space to put your supplies, okay? Um, now here's some of the duties that you would have. Okay. Checking the fetal heart tones, checking maternal vitals, such as blood pressure, temperature, pulse, and respirations. That's the first thing you would do upon intake when you're doing your charting is you would do the fetal heart tones before, during, and after a contraction. And you would record it that way so that you know exactly what the heart rate is before the contraction, during the contraction and after the contraction is over, okay? And you would chart it that way. 
And then you check um, the vitals by taking the mother's blood pressure, always checking what is her um, what is her normal blood pressure. So a mother could have a normal low, but if it jumps a lot, that could be considered high for her. Okay, so really knowing what her mean blood pressure has been throughout the pregnancy and the last part of the pregnancy. Um, ensure warmth and safety for the newborn, which means that you would try to have a draft-free room. Uh, make sure that you, if you don't have a way to warm your towels and your um, receiving blankets, that you have a a way that you could perhaps throw them in a dryer and you can have that tumbling around right at the end and then pull those out at the end too. The other way that we do it is we put a cookie sheet and we fold the towels and receiving blankets with either one or two heating pads plugged in and that will warm up the towels as well. But mainly keeping the newborn dry and skin to skin will help and then something over top of the baby, okay? that will help the newborn stay dry or stay warm, especially they lose a lot of uh, heat out of their heads. So making sure their head is dry. We don't use hats anymore. Unless you're outside and it's cold and you need a hat for warmth, then make sure the head's really dry before you put the hat on and change it if the hat's wet. Um, but there is a hormone that comes off the baby's head and it's very good for the mother's bonding. It's very good for the mother's hormone levels. And it's better for the baby not to have a hat in most cases, in general speaking. Okay. Now you want to check and report and record the condition of the newborn. You want to assess APGAR scores, which would be at one minute, five minute. And then if it's less than seven out of 10 at five minutes, you would do a 10 minute APGAR score. Okay. And then check maternal fundus and lochia, which is the blood flow. You check the, the fundus is what I just explained, where you're checking for the hard grapefruit status centrally between the umbilicus and the pubic bone, okay? And then you're also checking that the introitus for the flow, making sure that it's within normal range, okay? She's not soaking more than one to two pads in 30 minutes, okay? I mean, you, you have to kind of gauge that in your head. In the immediate postpartum, it would be um, more than 500 cc's is considered a hemorrhage. That would be two cups of blood. Now, if a mother has a low hemoglobin or she's got an iron deficiency of some kind, she could actually maybe not even handle losing 500 cc's. But then there might be another woman who's, you know, tall and has a high blood volume and she's got a high hemoglobin and she's really fit and she loses 500 and you can't even tell. She doesn't even look like she's lost any blood. So you have to go by the person's pallor. Are they staying present? Are they seeming completely normal responses? They're not going gray or pasty or kind of looking like they're going to faint or go into shock. So knowing how to recognize that is really important. Document findings in healthcare records as much as you can. You know, I think writing things down can be helpful. If you're in an emergency setting, there's probably very few things that you would worry about writing down. But I think the time of birth is helpful to know when when was the baby born. Okay. Um, in an emergency situation, you may need to help the midwife manage a shoulder dystocia or an undiagnosed breach. We've shocked, talked about shoulder dystocia a lot. You can go back and read, uh, watch the videos on that. Um, undiagnosed breach. I also talked about that in my last, not the last video, but the one before I talk about undiagnosed breach and how to manage it. Um, it's not as complicated as you think breach. It's a variation of normal. And so mostly it's hands off, let the baby hang, keep the room warm. And then the baby may need a little more stimulation and help with breaths because they don't get as much stimulation at the birth. Okay. Now um, assist the, the midwife with if the baby has non-reassuring fetal heart tones, you may have to do continuous monitoring of the heart tones um, and moving the mother, of course, can really help with that. If the mother's in a certain position and you move her, then you take the heart tones again. Well, oftentimes they'll come back. Could be just some pressure on the cord or something. If the mom's in the tub and the heart tones are high, you want to get her out 
and hydrator because that means the baby can sometimes be getting too hot inside. Or if the mother starts getting a low grade fever, then you need to start giving the mom more water. Of course, if she has a known case of strep B or something like that, hopefully you're working with a midwife and you can get her the help she needs um, with that. But keeping her on some levels of perhaps vitamin C and taking her temperature during labor would be maybe something you'd want to do if that was the case, okay? The risk factor goes up the longer the labor is, and the risk factor also goes up if she has premature ruptured membranes. So if her membranes are broken for more than 24 hours, then she becomes a higher risk. Some say 18 hours. Some say even more. But I think if you keep out of the bath, you only shower, nothing in the vagina, and you take vitamin C and maybe echinacea, and you... Um, Stay, keep your immune system really strong. That can be really helpful. So let's see, what else? Um, phoning emergency medical services, assisting with neonatal resuscitation can be really one of our, you know, one of our roles is that. And the way that we did that too is role play. We would role play several events, you know, three, two, three, three, two, three three two three we would role play several events with the ambu bag or with mouth to mouth at every birth okay we would also talk through okay what if we had a shoulder sticky shoulder what are we going to do we're going to do this you know so we're right on the same alignment with our plan and we could still be flexible with that but we have a plan and I think even in the scenarios, you could do that. You could say, okay, before the scenario starts, let's talk this through just for a couple of minutes. And you might review, okay, if we have a shoulder dystocia, we're going to try hands and knees. Then we're going to do Mick Roberts. Then we're going to do running start. Then we're going to do standing supported squat. And you've got these plans, you know, of things that you're going to do. I don't teach any internal movements, although we are taught that as midwives. We are taught hands going in and rotating the shoulders or removing the posterior arm can really help. You have to help bend the elbow and removing the posterior arm. But that's if you have, you know, uh, the skill and the, you know, sterilized gloves and everything else is being observed with sterile techniques so that you're not introducing infection. You know, those things are things we also use. But in these basic classes, I just mostly teach positioning to help release the shoulders, okay? But in an emergency setting with a midwife, and if you're an assistant, a midwife assistant, you need to know the whole protocol. You need to know what her preferences are, what rotations she usually does, like does she do, she likes to go straight for Rick Roberts, or she likes to go straight for shoulder, depending on if the mom's on her, on her back, Sometimes you'll just go straight into McRoberts or you'll have her turn to hands and knees, okay? So knowing what the midwife likes to do, okay? And if it's you, knowing how to follow the intuition that you're getting about what's going to help. And sometimes the mother will know. She will know how to move to get her baby out. And actually, when mothers are really in tune, I've seen this, they do, they know. They just do things and it's kind of like almost like a dance and suddenly the baby comes out. So engage the mother. Don't like have her be a passive, like we're doing this to you. No. Hey mom, we need help. Can you give a real big push with this one? You know, like get her engaged with you. Okay. What are some of the other things you might have to assist with um, setting up an intravenous therapy or intramuscular injections for postpartum hemorrhage? Yes, we would. Sometimes we'd have them drawn up depending on things, depending on we would have like a discussion, an informed discussion ahead of time about prophylactic management of third stage. And depending on the mother's preference or her circumstances or her history, we might have that um, uh, oxytocin already drawn up and ready for the injection. Okay. And then what are some other things? Check maternal vital signs, assist with CPR if needed, and assist in preparation for transport. You might also assist with a um, catheterization of the mother. Okay. 
Those are some of the lists. That's some of the list of your duties as a second birth attendant. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, last time I started this birth pod list, for those of you who have hung out with me and stayed with me, <laughs> hey, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. I'm going to continue on this list, okay? Now, the second page is quite a lot of reading. <laughs> I'll do my best to read this, okay? Thanks for joining me on Call on the Midwife. I hope you're well. I'm trying to really stick with my plan here. I hope you enjoy this class. I've only got one thing left to do, and that is to finish the second page of the birth pod list, okay? So I hope you are able to either write it down or uh, make, you know, make some notes. Cooking and sterilizing equipment, large stainless steel pot with lid, stainless box with secure lid to carry sterilized instruments, a kettle and a Kelly kettle. Equipment. Ultrasound machine with vaginal and abdominal probes, optional. Now you can get these cases now where you can, uh, they're like basically an ultrasound in a box. I'd really like to get one. <laughs> you don't need them all the time, but they're really good to have. Like say if you were suspecting breach or whatever you could check, or if you had twins and you needed to know the positions of the twins, I mean, there could be lots of things. We've actually, by the way, Rochelle Jolly wrote a twin section and it's in our new manual. It's in my new manual. This is the cover of the new manual that's actually there now at Midway Free Today if you want to order it. The, the DVD's not there yet, but this is the new cover, okay? So yeah, we added the twin section in there. So if you guys want to if you've already ordered it from Midwifery today, perhaps you could check with them and they might be able to send you the new one. I don't know. But anyways, there. Um, the equipment, blood pressure monitors, four per unit, stethoscopes, six per unit, fetal Dopplers with rechargeable batteries, solar charges, two per unit, fetal, oh, sorry, we care solar suitcases to recharge phones, tablets, Dopplers. These come with rechargeable Dopplers. Beds with headboards can be assembled on site for mothers and babies, Bed beds with headboards, okay? Cots for teen during rest periods. You can get these really nice sleeping cots and then you just get a nice foam that goes on it. Those can be really good. Mattresses with soft, flexible plastic covers. Six camp chairs per unit. Headlamp for each midwife, waka waka solar lamps. Kiwi manual vacuum extractor, one per unit. These could be replaced with Odin devices when they become available for purchase, okay? I'm not familiar with these, but I know what they are. They're vacuum extractors. Curtains or sheets with cords to hang them for privacy. Now, Oftentimes, in these cases, they might have an obstetrician there, obviously, who would know how to use these things, okay? Um, if the midwife is skilled, great. We don't normally get skilled in um, vacuum extractors. Curtains or sheets with cords to hang them for privacy. Instruments for cutting cord and suture. Remember, you want to do delayed cord clamping so the baby gets the full oxygen uh, supply and blood supply. So you want 10 sets per unit. Method for washing and disinfecting linens. And then medications and supplies, here we go. How are you doing? This is a long list, <laughs> but I thought some people would probably really appreciate it. I hope you do. Aim strip, urinary test strips, paper cups for urine samples, ultrasound Doppler gel, covers for vaginal probe if using ultrasound machine. Oxytocin ampules, 10 units uh, at 50 of them, 10 units each. Amoxicillin and clavulanate tablets, 200 for various infections. That's um, basically um, antibiotics. 
Okay. Methogen tablets, 30. Doxycycline tablets, 100 milligrams, 100 for gonorrhea and UTIs. Promethacillin, sorry, I'm going to say that again. Promethacillin ampules, 25 mg, 100, antihistamine in case of allergic reactions. Mesoprostol tablets, 100 mcg, 200. That's for hemorrhage or retained placenta. Mostly that's for postpartum hemorrhage. You know, it could even be a late hemorrhage, the mesoprostol. Glycerin suppositories, 2g, 2 grams, 50. Metronidazole, 500 mg tablets, 10 for vaginal bacterial infections. Um, Clotrimazole cream, 1%, 20 for yeast thrush, you know, th yeast or thrush. Like if the baby's got thrush, they can use that. Um, Clotrimazole cream, 1%, you need 20 of them. Contraceptive pills. Set of 2150. Naproxen 50. I think having um, condoms is good too, because for postpartum, it's good to have, for the mother to have a way that she can space her babies, even though breastfeeding can really help and uninterrupted breastfeeding without any introduction of bottles, soothers, and sleeping with your baby. So, in the times ahead, if you can't, Use birth control. You, breastfeeding spacing is something you could learn more about. Um, it can really help, okay? But I think having condoms and um, birth control pills in the, is a really good idea. Um, RH immune globulin, 300 mcg, 10, must be refrigerated. Um, and then the clotrimazole vaginal suppositories, 0.2 grams, 150. Surfactant vials, four, magnesium sulfate, one gram, and five gram ampules, 20 of each, 40% or 50% solution. And these should be kept in the refrigerator. Um, and then type zero negative blood, 20 units. Okay, now this is a lot of stuff, but this is, this is what Robin Lim has in her birth response um, modules that she sends to these post disaster places and her statistics like the obstetrical groups will go into the same uh, post disaster areas as Robin Lim. And they will be doing a bunch of cesareans because they don't know how to manage normal birth without intervening. And so they end up having this really, I mean, astronomically high death rate with the women because when they leave there, a lot of them end up getting infections because they're not, in proper environment that's clean enough and sanitary enough for them to maintain the, the, um, you know, the wound properly. And so she was having these fantastic rates, a hundred percent breastfeeding, low, low cesarean rates and high, high, um, uh, rates of positive outcomes for moms and babies. So that's what we want. Okay, let's just finish the list. We're almost done. Thanks for sticking it out with me. Whoever stayed the whole time, hey, Conceta Santoro. Thank you. Okay, if that's you, <laughs> whoever it is, and, and for people that come on here after and watch this, yes, it's that we're at 100, one minute and 23 seconds because it's important information. Or no, one hour and 23 minutes and 23 seconds, but it's because it's important information and it's worth it. Okay. We're going to keep going. Um, laminated eclampsia protocol sheets, four per 10. Like what do you do in the state? If you're, if a mother's having eclampsia, she's going into um, potential seizure. What are you going to do? You have to have the protocol. We do this, we do this, we do this. Magnesium, injections, IVs, whatever is happening. And then syringes, metal trays, two to four, suture, chromic and vicryl 3.0 with curved half-inch taper needle. 
stainless steel or sturdy plastic bowl for a placenta. I prefer stainless steel myself. 10 per unit. Bed pans, 10 per unit plus toilet facilities such as bucket with seat, three per unit. Yeah, having a toilet is really important. Metal bivalve specula, different sizes, 10 per unit. Dilation and curatage set, one per unit. Only if qualified personnel are available to use them, of course, yes. Thermometers, five per unit. Neonatal kits, 50 per unit. Those are the neonatal, uh, basically um, birth kits for each mom, the individual kits for the babies and whatnot. And with her pads and things like that, okay? So there's, um, there's 50 per unit, Ambu bags, two per unit, adult and neonatal, laryngeal mask airways. Now, if you don't know what those are, a laryngeal mask airway is a good thing to have because uh, doing intubation takes a lot of skill, takes a lot of updated practice. We used to have to be skilled in, in um, intubation in Canada. And um, I had to re, you know, re, uh, certify all the time every year in Canada but in the United States we do not have that in our scope of practice to do uh, um, intubation but here with a adult or a neonate laryngeal mask airway you're actually you you're actually able to almost intubate the baby just with this airway device okay it's really good um, five for adults and five for neonates Gloves, sterile in all sizes, 250, and non-sterile, all sizes, 100. There you go. We did it. <laughs> we got through almost an hour and a half of time. I'm just going to show you a couple more pictures to close. And then we are going to be done. I really like this picture of this baby. I'm doing laid back breastfeeding. Baby's so relaxed, eh? He was happy. And then there is a, another mama in the tub. Very happy. These are black and white. They're a little harder to see. Here's mama with her baby on her belly. Yeah. Here's another one. It's really nice. Really good. Breastfeeding. This one, baby's got a, a sleeper on, but really we recommend to keep baby um, just a diaper if you drink skin to skin. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. It was packed full of information. I hope you enjoy your Sabbath, if this is your Sabbath, and uh, bless your day. I'm going to go out for a nice walk and um, eat some lunch. So thank you for joining me on Call in the Midwife. Have a good one. Bye for now. <laughs>